Hello, everybody. My name is Ruth Rumack, and I am the founder and executive director of education at Ruth Rumack's Learning Space. And tonight we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Chavoshi, and he will be talking about uh, all sorts of things to do with mental health as well as preparedness for university um, and all of the different types of things that we can do to be successful both as parents and giving our, our students and our children the tools that they need to be successful for the upcoming year. So thank hello thank you for joining us tonight. My pleasure it's glad to be here. Oh, I'm so glad. So we've got a couple of people who have put some things in the chat. I'm just going to share those. We have uh, Annie who has one child starting grade 12 and one child just finished finished first year of university. So wow, so you've got some experience, Annie, on both sides. You're about going in with one and, and one has just come out the other end. And uh, well, let's see, another one of our participants, daughter will begin her first year in September, trying to prepare and invest in advance as best we can, yes. And also uh, someone whose son is started university last September while our daughter is starting this September. Wow, we've got a lot of people in that same uh, range where you've got just a couple of years apart. So you've been through it once and now you're about to do it again. And Susan says both. We have a 19 year old and a 12 year old. Our 19 year old just finished up online business oriented gap year. Excellent. Uh, and CB says, my second son will start this September. Excellent, excellent. So it seems like we all have a lot in common in terms of where, where our kids are at. Um, and we know that this year has been a particularly challenging year, not just year, but really the last 18 months. Um, let's start the slideshow and we're gonna get into it. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, what we will be we speaking about today. Uh, University readiness, what it's all about, what we can do to be successful, what, how we can help our children be successful, and how we can help ourselves be successful as parents as well. So a few um, housekeeping things that I will be discussing the academic side of things at first, and then Dr. Chavoshi will take over and talk about the, the uh, mental health and wellness side of things, as well as some academic aspects. And we will have lots of time to chat at the end. So save your questions and we will be answering questions. I know a few of you sent your questions in ahead of time. Uh, thank you very much for that. And for those of you who have questions as the presentation goes along, feel free to put them in the chat or, or we will, uh, as I said, open that question and answer period up at the end. So let's get started. Here we go. Here we, that's me and that's you. This is just a little bit about us. I will give you a little more background and I'm sure Dr. Chavoshi will tell you more about himself as well. He's a clinical and school psychologist and the director at the Psycho Ed Clinic. So we're very happy to have him and his expertise. Let's move on. So this year has been unusual to say the least. And we certainly have uh, kids who have had some real challenging situations, I would say, over the last 18 months. And I know that in, in our work at Ruth Rumax Learning Space, we see students as young as three all the way through to the end of high school. We made that transition to be purely online um, back in March of 2020. And what we found is that, you know, we were able to keep up with our students and their academic needs in both a multimodal, multi-sensory um, and an active way, which is the way we like to do it in person. And we were able to figure out ways to do that effectively and efficiently online as well. But one of the things that really stood out to us over this year was, first of all, the lack of socialization and that very difficult aspect of having to carry on all of your lessons online without that human day-to-day -day interaction. And I know Dr. Chavoshi, you're gonna talk about that later as well. Um, now we have students who have been at home primarily or have been working online for the last 18 months, ostensibly two school years. And they're having to make this transi transition into a university setting or a college setting where they don't actually know what it's going to be like. And there isn't really anybody who can tell them what it's going to be like because in many cases, it's new territory and things are changing and the universities are having to adapt as well. So we know it's going to be challenging, but at the same time, we also know that we can do some things to prepare 
for ourselves as parents and to help our, our children prepare to make that transition. So let's look at the next slide. So in my opinion, preparation is always the key for a smooth transition. And we can't prepare for everything. We don't know everything that's gonna come our way, but the more we can go through different scenarios and sort of gather our tools and, and create a big uh, bag of tricks, I like to call them, something we can reach in and pull out when we need it, um, the more we feel prepared, the, the less anxiety we feel. I don't know how you feel about that, Dr. Chavoshi, if you wanna jump in for a moment. Absolutely. And I think uh, one of the best ways to prepare is to get as much information early. So you're going in, not only knowing your options, but having a sense of control over the process. Absolutely. I agree. So tonight we're going to talk about academic preparation, which is something that, you know, our children and our students have been doing over a number of years. But now, of course, moving from high school to university and the last two years of being online high school to potentially online or hybrid university, we want to give them some stronger tools. And we want to make sure that the tools that they've been working on have been truly solidified so that they can use them uh, well and easily and effectively. And then uh, we will be talking about the emotional preparation, and that's what Dr. Chavoshi will talk about in a bit. And I really like this, this uh, I don't know if you call it a meme or this online piece of information that came out. We ask 18-year-olds to make huge decisions about their careers and financial future, when a month ago they had to ask to go to the bathroom. And I, I found that really interesting because this sort of placing all that responsibility on the student. So like, well, one month you were under my control and I was telling you what to do as the parent, but you know, come August 28th or September 1st, you're on your own and I'll see you later and hope you do well. We know that that's not necessarily um, accurate because we as parents are going to be there for our kids no matter what, even when they're off at residence or living on their own. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand how to make that transition as parents as well, and to have those conversations with our kids to make sure that they know, you know, when, when should they come back to ask for help and when do they want to kind of be a little more, ask for more hands off. So we'll get to that shortly. Let's move on. All right, what do we need to succeed? Academic skills. Moving on, we're doing a fast one. This is an overview. So at Ruth Max Learning Space, we, we see students one-on-one. -on -one. We work with all academic subjects and all types of learners, um, as well as students with particular learning needs and learning challenges. And one of the things that we, we look at when we're helping a student prepare for university, there's a long list, but I just pulled together some of these things that would be important. And for tonight, because we only have a short period of time, I'm going to concentrate on three or four of them to really, um, things that I think will really make an impact. But of course, that's only the tip of the iceberg. And when we work with our students, um, either one-on-one -on -one or in our small group university readiness program, we're covering all of these and more because of course, as we said before, the, the key to being most prepared is, or at least ang anxious, is to be most prepared. So let's take a look at the first one. This is a really interesting one. We're going to move to the next slide. And learning to decode your syllabi or the syllabus. And the syllabus, Joelle is going to switch ahead to the next slide if she can. She's, oh, there she is. She's my remote switcher. Um, when we are looking at a syllabus, a syllabus, for those of us who haven't been at university for a long time or aren't familiar with the word, it's basically the outline of what the course is going to look like. And colleges and universities, each professor creates their own syllabus or their own course outline. And that's usually handed out in the first day of class, although sometimes it's handed out electronically beforehand. Um, and they run the gamut between being really, really detailed, like I'm talking 20 to 25 pages worth of every single class with every single reading, with every single uh, test and assignment logged in to something that's a two or three pager, which may give you an overview of the class and an overview of the concepts that you're going to learn, but it's not giving you detailed week by week analysis. And 
this is a really big difference because kids in high school do not have exposure to this type of organization or this type of information. Usually they'll get something from their teachers in the first week of, of class that kind of goes over the main topics of the year with some, sometimes with assignments put in, sometimes just test dates, and sometimes just a welcome to the class and here are my class rules. So I think a lot of university students don't realize how important the syllabus is and how important I say decoding it is, meaning going through it, reading through it several times so that you get an understanding of what the, the uh, professor is looking for, or mapping out, we'll come to this later, mapping out when you are going to have your tests and assignments ahead of time so that you can uh, really get a big picture overview of what your term or your year is going to look like. So when we work with our students, that's an, an assignment or an exercise that we do. We will give them several different syllabi um, that we've gathered over the years and we'll analyze it together and we'll look for key information and we'll teach them exactly what to look for as they're going through that document. Um, and then once they understand what is required of them, have an understanding and overview, then we start looking at how do you plan for all of that, again, using different types of calendars and different types of organizational systems that we'll talk about in a moment. This is so important, if I could interject. Please. Um, I, I taught for many years at Seneca and I uh, was a professor, and especially during first and second year courses, I would invest a lot of time designing the syllabi. And oftentimes students wouldn't realize uh, that if a professor is taking time to put things on this, these are important. This yeah. is your essentially map of the most important events, highlights, and information you need to know during this semester. So taking this document and making sure it guides is almost like a tourist map, the lay of the landscape of your first year is going to save a lot of headache because oftentimes what I see happen with students is during that first year, it starts a little bit slow and it speeds up really quickly. And if they haven't mapped out exactly where those events, assignments, readings are, um, they don't have the sense of the usually the avalanche of work that's coming them their way. And so what happens is they suddenly get caught off guard with the amount of work that's been piling up. Um, so this is a wonderful place to start in helping students feel in control of their journey versus be caught off guard as the work is coming their way. I think, you know, I remember from my own university days, and that was a long, long time ago, but, you know, when, when I had that detailed syllabus, it made me feel much better going into class because I could mm -hmm. prepare ahead. When I, I didn't have the syllabus, I got a little bit, you know, um, off track, I would say, and having that document to refer to was really helpful for me. The other thing I want to talk about as parents, and this is something that you can work on with your kids particularly if your kids do have executive functioning challenges or they are easily distracted or they may be overwhelmed by too much um, print information. Often they're going to get a, a syllabus that has, like I said, could be 12 pages, could be 15, 25 pages long um, with very detailed information. And for some students, that overload of text is just too much and they don't even want to look at it. So what we find helpful is to sit down with somebody else and to read through it. And I know from my, my son, who is now almost 30, um, he and I would sit down, especially for the first and second year, and we would go through each of those syllabus, syllabi together. Um, and and we, had it, we did it more of a conversation like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. Oh, I can't wait till you start, you know, learning about this topic because that, that you know, I think that that's going to be really interesting for you. So it becomes more of a conversation than it does a work period. And I think as parents, we're going to also touch on this later, which is that communication with our, our, our emerging adults, how to approach a topic in um, a less judgmental and, and a less I would say teacher way and more of a conversational way. So having a sit down and looking at it over, you know, coffee or a hot chocolate might be something that you choose to do with your students once they start to receive these, these syllabi. Um, other things for different types of learners is color coding and uh, making sure that, that they are pulling out the information that's gonna be most salient or most important for them. Of course, there are many different ways to take this information and organize it, and uh, that's part of our expertise, which is figuring out what the learning style of the child is, and you as a parent would probably know that as well, and helping them to decode it and put it into um, 
into a way that makes more sense for them. Okay, let's look at the next. I just have a few uh, other examples. So here are some other examples of different syllabi and how they might look. And again, every person uh, has a different learning style and therefore they're going to see the information in a different way. So somebody who's very visual will really appreciate something that has a pie chart or something that's an infographic, whereas somebody who uh, prefers things in a more linear way may prefer, prefer what a chart form. And this is a key that I tell my students is to whatever form they like best, take, the ad inf take that information and reinterpret it for yourself. And just by actually reading it through and rewriting it in a different form, they are committing it to memory as well. So let's move on to the next one. All right, here's a, a, another huge topic that I can touch on right now, which is the organization and prioritization of things. And of course, we all know in our busy world, and as so many of us have been at home working, being full-time parents, being we're at work full-time, trying to navigate, helping our kids and helping ourselves, uh, organizing and prioritizing are just absolutely key in a university setting or in a, in a post-secondary setting. And one of the things that we use with our students is something called the prior priority matrix. And you can see it on the screen. It's a chart that has uh, two axes. And on the top, we have urgent and not urgent. And on the side, we have important and not important, and then four quadrants in each. So when we look at something, often we'll start with a student and look at um, some like general life things. So what are your priorities in a day or what are your priorities in the week? So that we're looking at the overview of their, their life at that moment, like a little snapshot. And we talk about the things that are urgent and important. We're going to pull those out first. And those are going to be things that are time sensitive or that you cannot change. So you would definitely put down, you know, classes that you have because they're time sensitive, uh, a test that's coming up, an assignment that's due, a lesson that you have booked or an appointment that you have booked, things that you can't change and that need to be done right now. That goes in the urgent and important quadrant, the first quadrant on the top left. Then we look at what is still important but not necessarily urgent, something that maybe has some time flexibility if you don't get to it today, you can get to it tomorrow morning. And some of those things I might look at, um, those are things that may not have a real due date, but they still need to get done. So a short reading or uh, something that you can negotiate the time and slip it into something else. That would be your do next pile. And then we move to the bottom where it's not so important and it's, but it's still urgent. That um, is something that needs to be done, but it would it would benefit you to do it. So maybe reading ahead a little bit uh, or preparing ahead for something that's coming up, but you don't have to do it right this second. And then the last quadrant, the last box is definitely not important and not urgent. And that's probably what people want to do first. Those are the fun things. Those are the things that are, you know, social and active and, and fun. And I was having this conversation with, with um, one of our teachers, actually the teacher who's teaching our university readiness course. And we were saying that sometimes the things that we see as not important and not urgent actually are important and urgent. And those would be things like preparing yourself, um, helping your own mental health, getting out for some exercise, making sure that you do your grocery shopping so that you're eating well. Um, and so we want to help our kids learn and figure out what's, what is the priority and where we go with it. What do we do first and next? I don't know, Dr. Chavoshi, if you have some, something to add to that. I think this is fantastic. I, I usually try to do this myself on a weekly basis. I think we often get caught up and bogged down doing um, a, a things that feel urgent, but aren't, whether it's sending off emails. And I think with students, because they may not have picked up that executive function skill of realizing what is really important, um, sometimes they focus on things that aren't important, but are under their control. So for example, doing the course readings or continuing to read when they have to start writing an assignment. Um, because the writing task is hard, they may put it off 
doing something that feels productive. So I'm, I'm reading the textbook that's productive, but that's actually not what's important in that moment because the assignments do tomorrow and they have to start producing something. So that um, noticing what's relevant and then honing in on it, I think it's a skill that many students in first year struggle with and oftentimes leads to uh, cramming and you know, staying up all night to do an assignment. And it's wonderful to see the work you do with your students, Ruth, in helping them have that bird's eye view at the beginning of the week so they can hone in on, on the most important and aspects of the academic timetable. I think that that's something that you as a parent can do at home as well, starting now, or you know, if you've got younger kids and you wanna start practicing it even earlier, but talking about your week, as you were saying, talking about, uh, okay, well, you know, we're going up to the cottage this weekend and I've got three days to pack. What do I need to do first? How do I, do I need, like, I've got to get the laundry done first because if I don't do the laundry, then we're not gonna have clean clothes to take. Or I have to do the grocery shopping before I can pack up the car. So. When we look at how this impacts our daily life, um, I think that that it's, of course, as I said, we always want to do the things that are going to be the, the most fun first, but we have to teach our kids and sometimes we have to teach ourselves also how to break it down into these four quadrants, which seem to make things make more sense. Um, I was going to add to this that once we look at the big picture, then we can use this priority matrix for something much smaller, like a long-term assignment. And when we use it for a long-term assignment, we're looking at very specific things that help a, a student break down the, the different aspects of that assignment so that they understand, I think, as you were saying, not to get caught up in the tiny minutia uh, or, or of something that you know, isn't really do that next moment, but looking at the steps and how to get from one step to the next so that you keep pushing forward and moving your assignment forward. All right, let's look at the next one. So here is a, a slide all about methods of time management, which is another huge aspect to being successful in life and particularly uh, post-secondary. And there are many, many, many different things available online and many different strategies and tools. And I've just pulled out a few of them that I think might be interesting things that you may not know about um, as parents. So organizing your tasks, we looked at, we talked about a big calendar, uh, we talked about color coding. There are many online ta uh, tools. One of them is called Trello, which is, um, you can see the big picture here where this is somebody's lesson planning Trello. It's a way of organizing tasks into um, not only priorities, but also color coding them and putting things in the order of importance. Um, and it allows you to move one task from one day to a next if it doesn't get finished. It allows you to show the tasks in various different ways. Um, and it would be similar to taking the, the post-it notes, the different colored post-it notes, and putting them on, um, on a grid or on your wall. And this is a, a more sophisticated or I guess online way of doing it you won't lose your little little stickies that's the thing that I hate the most is when you put them on the wall and then you come back and they're all on the floor so um, this is a way that you can keep it with you and your kids can uh, access this information at any time so Trello is one of those organizational methods um, another way that we teach our students to organize their time and, and manage their time is something called the Pomodoro method. And the Pomodoro method is um, a method of 25 minutes of work, concentrated work, you're turning off all your other distractions, you're going for it, and then a five minute break. And if you can handle that, you might do two of those in a row. So you do 25 minutes of work, five minutes of break, 25 minutes of work, five minutes of break, and then maybe take a longer break or, or switch it up and, and do something else. Um, some people will do two 25 minutes together. So do 50 minutes of work and then a 10 minute break and then keep cycling through that. And there's, there's lots of research behind it. And, and I'm sure Dr. Chavosh, you can add to that in terms of how, how it works mm -hmm. for our brain. I absolutely love that you have this up here. Uh, it's one of my favorite techniques. It's one of those cases where a very simple solution can be so transformative. And the reason for that and the science behind it is about structured breaks. And one of the biggest challenges students face, I mean, we all face, but students, especially when they enter universities, attention management. We're bombarded with distractions, temptations, your phone notification going off. And to be able to engage in a focused manner becomes increasingly difficult the more the student 
student tries to persist. So what happens after students are working for more than half an hour, they get sidetracked. They may go on YouTube, they may check their phone. And so when you introduce a technique like the Pomodoro technique, where it has, it has breaks built in, but also in it, it has the idea that during those 25 minutes, you are solely focused on that one activity you're doing. It does two things. First, it makes sure that the youth is taking breaks, which is very healthy for learning. Second, it makes sure that the attention is maintained and focused and not disrupted. And this is a technique I used to teach all my students in their first year. And in fact, as grad students, myself, we used it to help us with maintaining attention on long term tasks like writing an essay or a dissertation. So it's a wonderful tool. And it's one that as parents, you can start teaching your child because it's a simple timer. It's there's no complexity behind it. But the complexity comes in teaching the child or the student that they can manage their attention into chunks and these units of chunk these chunks of time become um, a measure of how much work something will take. So now I have students that tell me, oh, I have this assignment. I think it's going to take me three Pomodoros. So it becomes <laughs> a chunk of time that you understand, oh, this is how much work I need to put into a task. And that chunking is really helpful in helping us map um, our workload and how much energy and attention we can spend on a different task um, and how much it will require. Uh, so it's a wonderful technique, Ruth, and I, I do think any you know, student, adults, graduate students, anyone benefits from a structured break um, technique, such as the Pomodoro technique. I would say that we use it in our house all the time. And, you know, I have a 12 year old and I have an mm -hmm. almost 30 year old and uh, and my husband, of course. And, you know, when we're when we have a task to do, like doing the dishes or cleaning up, you know, doing our chores, whatever that's, we will put that uh, timer on for 25 minutes. And if you guys don't know about the timed timer, hang on, I'm just going to grab it. If I can grab it. The timed timer is one of my favorite things, especially for kids who have trouble understanding how time works. And it shows you, you set the dial and it shows you that red is how much time you have left. So as your time dwindles, you can see physically and visually that you have less and less time left. It's noisy. Um, so something that keeps us alert. You can have a time timer on your cell phone as well. You can set alerts for your cell phone. There are all kinds of techniques, again, that we can share. Um, but the most important thing is to de dedicate that time before moving on and then taking the break because the brain needs the break. And some of the things that we use as brain breaks. So if you are taking your five minutes, but you just need to clear your head, do a Sudoku or a crossword or a jigsaw puzzle, something that changes the way that your brain is processing information. And of course, an active or physical break, get out, shoot some hoops, go for a walk, you know, run up and down the stairs. But something that, again, gives you um, a physical space change and helps your brain to look at something differently. All right, let's move on to the next one. What have we got? So, uh, the, the another huge part of university or college or any kind of post secondary program is, of course, note taking. And when you get to the university or college level, you realize, you know, that that students are not as prepared as they could be for note taking when they're in the high school situation. The lectures uh, or the time frame of classes is much smaller and they don't have formal practice or techniques that they are necessarily taught. Some schools do, but not all do. They just kind of assume that you're going to pick it up along the way. So there are some um, templates that we use for note taking. There's one called the Cornell method, which is a very, again, structured way of, of keeping your notes in, in a template. Um, we have many, many techniques that we share. But one of the things that I want to talk about uh, is this idea of the neural connection. And there is so much research between handwriting, you know, we're all on the computers all day and we're typing and our kids type so fast, they type so much faster than I do. But they, there is something to be said for picking up a pen or a pencil and actually handwriting your notes, whether you're printing them or you're using cursive. But in fact, the studies that I've looked at show us that there's a stronger connection to cursive writing and, and memory and connection with the material then there is even to uh, printing, although printing is still better, handwriting with your hand is still better than typing them. And as a technique, we, we do encourage our students at some point in their study trajectory, 
to take those notes and write them out by hand. Maybe they're doing their first set of notes on the computer, on the, on the you know, saving them um, by typing. But at some point when you're trying to remember something, it's best to handwrite it. Um, next is the idea of technology-based note-taking. And again, there are many different ways that a student can um, use technology in their lectures. So, you know, you'll go into a lecture hall or online right now and you'll see all the kids are taking their notes by by computer which is also very good as long as they're structured they're there they can go back to them but we also have opportunities to audio record if your pr professor gives you permission i think you do have to ask permission if you have a learning challenge you will be given special permission and sometimes you'll even be given a note taker for you uh, but still i think a, a, an individual should be taking their own notes in whatever way they can um, you could use an app like Otter, which is um, a transcribing app. You could also use something called the Live Scribe Pen, which is the most amazing thing that I've ever seen. It is a pen, and I, I wish I had one to show you today, but I have one at the office. One, it's a pen that has a microphone on the tip, so it looks like a regular pen, has a microphone on the tip, and it has a camera on the bottom where the the pen part is and you write on special dot paper and what happens is as you are recording the lecture and you're writing your notes you don't even have to write words you could just write a number and circle it and the computer when you download it to your computer or upload it back to your computer all you have to do is touch that place on this special paper and then the recording will jump to that exact spot so you can sync up any kind of special notes or something that you want to remember or the professor says something about a test that's coming up you can make a little symbol and then go back to that exact spot in your audio recording to gather all that information so so much is out there and available um, in terms of of uh, assistive technology or just technology in general that can be helpful and useful and it's really important to have your kids or, or encourage your kids to experiment with all of the different things that are out there and probably i would suggest to experiment before they get to class so that they know what they're looking at and what works best for them dr tavoshi Absolutely. it's probably one of the most important things i get students to do before they start their post-secondary journey um, in the school system uh, we do this training for all uh, the students in the gta uh, on getting ready for university. And one of my main recommendations to them is that when it comes to note-taking, the research is there that handwriting is more effective. And I'll be honest, I'm just more comfortable with typing. So I'm one of those who likes to type my notes. And it's really important to have the right tool for the right purpose. So when it comes to typing notes, there are many wonderful note-taking applications that have built-in audio recording. And the one tip I give students is do not use you know, Microsoft Word or the a note processing application for note taking, take time to learn an actual note taking application. And there are many out there um, that are built for this purpose because that will create so much more um, efficiency and also better organization down the road. Yes. And I would also say that, you know, often students will think that writing your notes out once, you write them out and you're done. Once and you're done. But in fact, it's the more times you go back and you refine mm -hmm. them and you look at them again and you highlight the things that are most important, that's where you're really going to see the patterns uh, and the themes and the, the, the important overarching ideas coming through from your course. And often a professor will mention something that is important many, many times. So if you're taking mm -hmm. good notes and you see the same thing coming up over and over again, you have a good uh, opportunity to, to think or to predict that that may be something that's on a test or an exam or something like that. So looking for patterns in your notes is also an important piece to note taking in general, not just the organization and the color coding and, and keeping things organized. Okay, let's look at the next one. I feel, Dr. Chavoshi, like we need three days to give this to give this presentation. So I mean, you have a whole course, and that's what it really takes. These are important skills to learn, and and these are skills we don't often teach students explicitly. We just hope they pick up. But if we do teach them before they start, they have such an easier transition um, to post secondary. 
Exactly. And that's exactly why we created the course in the first place. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to you. And, uh, and I'm going to let you do your thing. And then I'll be here. And, and if you if you want me to add something in, I'd be happy to. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm quite passionate about helping students with this transition point in their lives. Uh, and part of that reason is because this was my research. So when I was uh, doing my PhD at York University, I was researching ways to help students during that transition to university. And later when I became a professor, um, and I was also part of the campus psychology team at York, uh, we often see students who are really struggling and wonder what are the tools that they're lacking that's preventing them from doing well. Because these students, many of them were A plus in high school. And we know that during the transition from high school to university, one of the things that changes is the scaffolding, is the structure, where students go from this very structured environment where there are many adults who are observing them, um, checking in on them on a daily basis, to first year classes where you have lectures of thousands of people, where no one knows your name, no one knows if you're there. And there's a lot of responsibility that the student has to suddenly take a lot of ownership over their own studies. And some students may lack those specific skills to do this successfully. And when we teach those skills, because they are learnable, um, they do so much better. So after I left uh, uh, Seneca, I joined the, the school boards uh, as a psychologist in Toronto. And now I get to work with students in grade 12 in high school as they're preparing for that transition. So I get to see both sides. And I know how when we prepare students, not only are we academically setting them up for success, but they also emotionally do so much better. Because when you enter this scary new situation with zero tools, it's understandable to be anxious. I mean, anyone feels anxious in a new situation when they don't have preparation. But when we give them a few tools and we show them how these tools can help them during this journey, students do so much better. They calm down, they're more focused, and they have this sense of control over their environment and a sense that I can do this. And that's a really important feeling. We call that self-efficacy, the sense that I have the skills and tools it takes to face a challenge and be successful. Um, so I'll be going over a few different tips that uh, over the years I've, I've developed to help students during this transition. And of course, um, this is an, an app appetizer. Um, uh, we, we don't have a lot of time to go in depth. And, and this is why it's so wonderful that there are um, groups like Ruth who are providing these in-depth tools to students in a more structured and routine manner. So moving forward with this, Joel, I'm going to see if I have got the access. Wonderful, I do. Um, uh, first, I want to bring your attention to what Ruth mentioned about the time period we're in right now. This transition is particularly difficult because our youth have been impacted by COVID-19. There was a recent study that came out that looked at the third wave, so the third round of closures we had leading up to the last bit of school that was all virtual. And during that period, many youth reported really experiencing um, some level of harm in, in terms of their mental health due to COVID, due to those restrictions, not seeing their friends at school, just the prolonged period of being at home and not having access to those routines that gave their life structure beforehand. And this is particularly true for the youth who are transitioning to university, for that emerging adult age group, for that late adolescent emerging adult age group. And there have been all these interrupted rites of passage that would mark these transitions and help people have a sense of predictability, whether it's the prom, the graduation ceremony, uh, orientations, frosh week. Now, you know, knock on wood, I'm hoping in September we are moving back to in person. Um, so based on my work at York, I know that we are doing most classes in person uh, and there'll be many different orientation opportunities that will happen in person. However, that routine of having that preparation before and has been lost for the students who are entering in September and those who entered last September. And it's important to recognize when we have these uh, this loss, this disruption in routines, it's understandable that students may feel underprepared for this transition. They don't have the same script that many would have had in the past. And even that script was insufficient. So the students entering into university right now, they're entering this new environment, feeling that they may not have enough of a runway to take off for it. And this is showing up in research across the board. So what do we do? First, I think it's important to recognize that this is a particular period of time, that this is unusual and th this is difficult. 
and to recognize that many of us, all of us, are experiencing some form of grief due to the losses we've experienced. Now, grief comes from sometimes the loss of a loved one. It also comes from the loss of routines, normalcy, rites of passage. And there has been tremendous amount of loss over the last year and a half. And our youth have faced that loss, the loss of seeing their friends, the loss of having those transition points in high school, maybe the loss of a graduation ceremony. And I think when we are experiencing grief, it's understandable that we will have various emotions from sadness to anger to guilt. And then those are all normal. Grief is a journey. And many of us may be on that journey. And that's okay. And it, I think it's, it's okay to recognize that we as adults may struggle and so will our youth at different points. And by normalizing that struggle, what we are doing is we are giving our youth permission to approach us with their pain, with their problems, and to not shy away or to be afraid of judgment or of disappointing their parents if they are struggling. So one of the most important pieces of advice I give parents is to have a conversation with their youth before they start their post-secondary journey and to let them know that it is okay if they struggle during this transition. In fact, pre-COVID, the statistics that we used to collect uh, at post-secondary institutions showed us that about 30% of students did not successfully finish first year and move on to second year. Now, that many of those would later transition back or switch institutions, so they would have successful outcomes down the road, but during that period, they would struggle. And now that's become even heightened because of these disruptions due to COVID. So it is okay to have a conversation with your youth. In fact, I think it's helpful and say, you may struggle this year. You, you may experience anxiety. You may feel overwhelmed at points, and that's okay. This is part of the journey, and I'm here to support you as you're going through it. And there are other systems in there to support you, and we'll explore what they are. Now, the reason why we really want to do this before the journey starts is because sometimes when youth are struggling, especially young adults, emerging adults who, you know, that they're feeling like they're ready for the world, um, they may be shy or they may feel shame to approach help. And when they're struggling, they may especially feel ashamed of letting their parents know they're struggling academically um, because they may anticipate negative judgment or a sense that they've disappointed their parents. And that's definitely what we don't want. We want youth to come to us when they are struggling. Um, so how do we help emerging adults with this transition? I'm going to go over a few small points. I think let's start, and, and, and Ruth brought up this conversation of the changing role of the parents. And it's a changing of roles from being someone who's taking control or who's in charge, who's giving clear directions, to a more step back role where you're there for support. You're saying, I'm here if you need me. I can even help you collect some of the resources you need. Um, but you're really, the ball is in your court. You're the problem solver. So one of the key um, elements of this change of role, uh, where in psychology we call it granting autonomy to the youth, is really letting them take charge of uh, problem solving. Um, so that you are there when they approach you, but if they are experiencing a problem, they are the ones who are in charge of implementing the solutions and reaching out to the resources, perhaps with your help if they come and ask for it, but they are in charge. And this can be difficult as parents because we are used to jumping to the rescue. You know, we are used to being that lifeguard. And it's an important skill for youth to learn to problem solve, but also self-advocate when they are having a challenging situation. And there are many support systems in place in post-secondary. And those systems, uh, first, will not necessarily speak to parents because they will be treating the youth as an adult, even if they're a 17-year-old. And second, uh, the, the youth will benefit from having that sense of control that e when they are struggling, they are able to reach out for help. But there are some things we can do to prepare the way for them. And, and during this presentation, I'll, I'll bring out a few that I, over time I've found to be very helpful, both when I was a campus psychologist at York University and also uh, when I'm working with youth now um, in my own clinic here. So rule number one I have, and this is uh, really for the youth, but as parents, you can help them with this, is to show up. Because oftentimes anxiety leads to avoidance behaviors. And when we show up, um, that anxiety quickly tapers out. And we are able to partake, learn, and really start enjoying our post-secondary experience. And one of the most important things to show up to during this post-secondary journey are the orientations. And there are many different varieties of it. Departments have orientations. Many of them are online right now, and some of them are in person. 
And these orientations are immensely helpful, not just in terms of the content they give the youth, but more importantly, in helping them feel that they belong to the institution, forge social connections, so that when they go there on their own, they feel comfortable. They feel like they're in a place that they, they, they feel safe in, that they know people at. And one of the most successful predictors of that transition from first year to second year is how well socially integrated the youth is in their institution. So my first rule to youth and to parents who are supporting youth during this transition is to help them show up. Now, some youth may have difficulties. They may have social anxiety. Um, they may have certain sensitivities, especially if you have a youth who has autism. And most institutions, if not all of them, have in plans in place to help these youth. I remember many, many, many years ago, I was a fresh leader myself, and we would have a dedicated team to help students who are facing social anxiety to make sure that they can have as successful of a social experience as other youth. And this has only increased over the years as we've become aware of how disabilities and mental illness can interfere with youth accessing post-secondary services. Um, so rule number one, show up, and it's okay to be anxious. In fact, you can reach out to the organizers of orientation, let them know that you're anxious and uh, you're afraid that you won't be able to fit in on that first day, and they will help remediate that. That, that actually puts a real <laughs> human aspect to all of the orientation at things. I think, <laughs> you know, when you go, when you're making that transition and you're going to a new place and you don't feel that you know anybody, there are no familiar faces, maybe you're going with some friends, but maybe you're not. At, it, just knowing that there is somebody that is looking out for you makes mm -hmm. it much more approachable. For sure. And I think as parents, this is an, an, a place where, again, you can't force the youth, but you can be there to support them through this process to help them find out when the orientation date is, who they can contact if they're feeling uncomfortable, making sure it's in the calendar, it's uh, the dates are known and saved, because it's one of those critical, pivotal points where if the youth is able to partake in, it will really ease their experience into the institution. And, and I would also add that uh, contacting orientation staff or leaders is very normal. So uh, it has to be instigated by the youth. This is another area where as parents, we, we, we can't jump in and take over, but it is something that as, as Ruth mentioned, may help the youth feel that they already have someone who is looking out for them, especially if the youth is going to an institution that is away from home, where they're going to be living in residence. So, I have a couple of uh, institutions that, that I've looked at in, in Ontario to see what their plans are, and they all have some form of orientation happening. They used to be virtual, but now they are moving more and more to in-person events. So I would suggest that you reach out to the institution. There will be an actual orientation page for each university um, that describes the plans for that orientation, and first-year students are automatically contacted by email. The second rule I have, and this is for the youth, and again, as parents, you can communicate and help them uh, engage in it, is to emphasize the importance of partaking in the experience of university, of joining a club, an organization, being involved in campus. So we've done many studies over the years at what are the successful variables that help students adjust to university and do well academically. And it is surprising perhaps to you, uh, and it was to me when I first started doing this research, that high school average or GPA was not the biggest predictor. In fact, one of the biggest predictors of success were social support and social connections. So we know that youth who are socially engaged in their institution do much better, not just in terms of their emotional well-being, but also academically. So if you have a youth who's really focused academically and they're worried about this taking time away from their studies, there's tremendous research showing that this is actually helpful for their studies. Because through these networks, not only do they build up the reserves, the energy to partake in their academic activities, they also make the friendships, the connections that can help them form study groups, that can help them learn from their peers, from uh, those who have taken those courses previously. So they gain access to all this knowledge and experience that they wouldn't if they are kind of going at it lone wolf on their own. It is so important to be involved socially in the institution that uh, I would say that's one of the uh, cardinal rules of a successful transition to university. And again, I want to point out that Executives and club organizers have built in mechanisms to help youth with disabilities, youth with um, uh, any uh, 
psychological challenges that may be getting in their way participating, including social anxiety and autism. So if you have a youth who is um, who, uh, concerned about being able to fit in because of those challenges, there are built in systems to help them um, navigate and, and feel at home in whatever organization they join. And you know, during uh, the fall, there will be uh, uh, club fairs, organization fairs, where uh, youth can get a chance to see all the different things that are happening on campus. And most campuses are like a large city, so there's a lot going on. And they can find their niche, what they like. Um, and it's important to find at least one thing. So my rule to youth, and this is what I tell my grade 12 students as they are uh, going off to university, uh, I, I give them homework. I'm like, you have to find one organization, club, within the first month that you join and show up to at least one of their meetings. And that I find that to be really helpful in terms of helping their social transition. I think also that at that level, at the university level, because a university is like its own city, there mm -hmm. is something for everyone. Absolutely, so yeah. whether you want to join a knitting club or a Dungeons and Dragons club or a soccer club yeah. team, there is so much that they will they will be overwhelmed, I think, by the choices in terms of what they can mm -hmm. join and what they want to participate Absolutely. in. Absolutely. There won't be a lack of options. It's more the understanding that this is important. You know, we had the priority grid that this is actually something that's important, even though we can think of it as being a distractor from academics. It's actually equally important. I would put it in that first quadrant. Um, and, and rule number three, and, and, and you know, Ruth, you all mentioned this when we're talking about the syllabus, is the importance of actually having a plan, a bird's eye view of the semester as the students are going in. And uh, uh, if your youth isn't using a calendar, that is something as a parent that you can help them develop the skill of using a calendar because it will be crucial to their uh, success during that first semester as they're bombarded with these long syllabi with many different deadlines and assignments. And suddenly they have to navigate it without the teacher reminding them every day, right? So they're on their own. If they hand it in late, they don't show up to an exam. They may not even get an email from the department until at the end, letting them know that they're about to fail the course. So it's so important to have that preparation, that view of what's happening in the semester as they go into it. And then once they have the big view, they can start filling it in with other activities, whether social activities, exercise, uh, uh, extracurricular classes that it can join. Pre-planning routines um, is one of the best predictors of a good study habits during that first year. And so I have two things I really like and I, I often get students to do. One of them, I'm a big fan of the post-it note calendar where you just make a giant calendar on the wall. So if, it's, if you're, your youth is going to the dorm or to the residences, you can actually do it in the residence wall just using uh, uh, scotch tape, building a large calendar and really using post-it notes to put up all the approaching deadlines so they really see what's happening. And I often ask youth to have at least two months, the current month and the month ahead. So they really have a sense of what's coming up for them. Um, and you know, universities usually on, on orientation or in the bookstore you can buy it, have these uh, erasable calendars that you can get. Get two, again, it's important to have the, both the current month and the month ahead so the youth has a sense of what's coming up ahead. Um, after doing that, the next step is to pre-plan weeks. And this is really important because once you pre-plan study times, it really gives the youth a sense of how much time they actually have. We often overestimate the time we have. So if once you put in your classes, your lunch period, maybe your social activities, you may notice that you only have 10 hours of studying a week. And by pre-planning those study times, it's a form of commitment. It helps the youth know that, okay, from Wednesday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., I'm going to the library and I'm studying this topic. And what that helps the youth do is make sure that things don't pile up. So if you're investing about three hours per course per week, um, that's roughly what's required to stay uh, on track with that course. And I often get youth who are transitioning to university to pre-plan at least three hours for each course they're taking in their weekly calendar. And before they know it, it's, it's more or less filled up. There's some room for socialization, for physical activity, and for joining a club or two. And I think once they have that, they can have a good sense of what their week is going to be like. I, you know, that's a really interesting statistic because we use something very similar. I, I've heard mm -hmm. that it's one hour, four hours of studying for one hour of lecture. But mm -hmm. if we look at three hours average for a, a course and you're taking five courses, you're looking at at least 15 hours, right? So least, that yeah. is something I think is shocking to sometimes put it out in that clear a term that, well, how many hours are there in a week? You know, how many hours are there mm -hmm. in a day? And if you're expected to be putting in at least 15 to 20 hours 
of study outside of your lecture time, mm -hmm. you, you know, that's something that mathematically we have to wrap our heads around. Yeah, and, and I think once the youth puts that in and then tangibly sees it, feels it, they realize that, listen, in, in a day, we may have six hours of uh, energy attention that we can actually, you know, we may have 12 hours of waking time, but realistically, um, of those 12 hours, if you're already in lecture for four or five hours, at most, the youth can now do another two, three hours of studying. So when we put it all in, the youth can see that, oh, they, they, they have limited time, and it's important to invest that time on a weekly basis versus letting it pile up. And that's one of those skills because we talked about executive functioning that I think it's really important to train beforehand. And that's I'm so happy to hear that that's something that uh, you work on in your university readiness course. I think these are the skills that we don't teach kids and that could be immensely helpful for them as they enter into first year. What I often see happen, and this is what happened when I was at the campus psychology office, is that students um, have a good time during the first few weeks because much of it is review, course is going slow. And then things really pick up quickly, they hit midterms, and then they uh, really struggle, they feel overwhelmed, and that anxiety can sometimes lead to avoidance behaviors, to um, procrastinating, even avoiding the assignments, and I would then see them at the psychologist's office where they would be experiencing a lot of anxiety and potentially burnout. So it's really important to have that steady output so that they don't feel this tsunami coming their way, uh, you know, about seven weeks, eight weeks into the semester. So that was a question that we received ahead of time, actually, which mm -hmm. is, you know, when, how do I know when to step in as a parent? You know, how do I know when they can't handle this on their own? And I think you're going to talk about it coming up. Yeah. But it's to think about as a parent, where, when do I cross that line? Because I feel it's dangerous. And when, mm -hmm. when am I just there to support and, you know, help them take deep breaths and get, get back on track? So that's a wonderful question. And I think the first thing to realize is that, as a parent, you are, it, it is okay to support your youth. I mean, that's, that's what parents are there for. So we are not saying that the parent has to essentially uh, just you know, walk away and uh, let the youth learn to swim or drown on their own. It's, it's that you are a source of support. It's more about how you deliver that support. And now it's a relationship where, uh, where instead of you being in charge of always being monitoring and delivering where the youth has to reach out for the support. And to help that, one of the things that can lay a good plan is to anticipate what will what what is your plan going to university if you are struggling. So when it comes to mental health, I often get parents to have a, what I call a struggle plan. So ha having a conversation with the youth, sometimes even writing it down and saying, okay, like if things are getting overwhelming, if you are feeling that you don't have what it takes to do uh, deliver academically, socially you aren't doing well, um, if you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, maybe your mood isn't like it used to be, um, how do we help you, right? And let the youth be in charge of devising that plan. And the part of that plan may be that they call you and they ask you to, for example, come and pick them up and for them to live at home for a bit. Maybe the plan is for them to reach out to their family doctor. So you can develop a plan collaboratively and the owner of that plan is the youth. It's the youth who is devising it. It is the youth who's enacting it. And uh, as part of that plan, um, there are a couple of important notes that I always get uh, youth and parents to do. I used to do this when I was uh, the campus psychologist and I do it now when I work with youth in private practice or in the school system. And I have the parents and youth uh, really map out what are the resources available to the youth if they are struggling. So uh, often I give them a homework, almost like a treasure hunt. And I say, go to the campus if you're doing an in-person visit and actually walk to the accessibility services or the wellness services. Now they have different names based on the institution, but they're usually called, uh, called the uh, accessibility and wellness services or counseling services. And to actually physically walk into that building, just knowing where that is, it really helps the youth know how to access it. It removes that behavioral barrier. I get the parents and the youth to take one of the pamphlets. So they have it, they have the phone number, they know who to contact. I get the youth to have as part of their plan, the phone number for their family doctor if they wanna reach out. And there's always a doctor on campus too. So all campus wellness and accessibility services have a doctor's office and you can uh, find that during this planning stage. Um, so I, I, and as a parent, one of the ways where you can give the youth the driver's seat is not to give this to them as homework, not to you know, tell them you, you have to do this, is to say, show me. Um, teach me how, uh, what are the services available in your institution? Let's find them out together. 
um, you know, take me to the building where uh, a student can go if they're struggling, maybe not you, but one of your peers. So if, if I had to help someone, I know where to take them. Um, take me to the building you go where you can find someone to talk to, a peer support network. And to do this almost treasure hunt of what are the resources and what are the services available to the youth together and have the youth teach you where those are and how you would contact them. So when you're in that building, ask the youth. So if, if a student was struggling, how do they initiate connection? Who do they call? Who do they email? Oftentimes those minor steps of which phone number do I call? Who do I talk to? Are the main barriers that prevent people from accessing support. We call those behavioral barriers in psychology. Sometimes the simple thing of not knowing which door to enter to prevents people from taking the action to go and see a doctor. So when you do it, and when you have the youth in the driver's seat and having them teach you how to access those services, then the youth feels um, that they're knowledgeable, that they have self-efficacy. And that feeling of self-efficacy, that they have what it takes to do this, helps them when they are struggling themselves, but also helps them if they, one of their peers are struggling. So they can also help that peer access services. Um, there is a wonderful phone line. This is a distress phone line that is especially for university and college students. It's uh, staffed by a provincial uh, group of uh, therapists. It's actually by the Ontario government. It's called Good to Talk. And um, I give this number to all students. I have them put in their phone and I tell them if you're ever struggling, if you're ever overwhelmed, this is a resource that you can reach out to anonymously and get help if you're even uncomfortable going to your campus's services for the time being. And they can provide immediate support to the youth in terms of helping them uh, explore their emotional state and also access services if they need that. So important. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these are tips that I often teach youth, and I think as, as parents, it's, it's good to be aware of them, about what are the key predictors of emotional well-being during university. Um, physical exercise is, is one of the most important ones, so helping the youth access the gym, knowing where the building is, and just telling the youth that this is important and that you know, this is worthwhile investing in. Um, maintaining sleeping and, and eating routines, and this is particularly important if your youth is in residence. It's one of the things that uh, some youth most youth struggle with, especially during that exciting first uh, few months of university when they're um, juggling a lot of social activities, new academic challenges. And again, as a parent, you can't step in and, you know, force a sleeping schedule, but you can check in with them and say, hey, how, how's your sleep going? And is, is that something that, you know, is getting in your way? And is, is that something that you need help with? Um, so you can always check in as a parent. That's totally okay. Um, it, it is uh, not okay at this point for you to try to step in unless the youth is really sending you an invitation. Otherwise, they may start not giving you information or not giving you that access that, that you would need if they are really struggling and need your help. And uh, I often teach youth relaxation exercises, such as mindfulness meditation, deep breathing, uh, and there are various tools that can do that too. I think this is a topic for a longer presentation and, uh, and uh, of work, for example, during the course they do with, uh, with Ruth. So uh, I'm going to just wrap up by talking about something that's really important. And that's if you have a student who, is, uh, uh, who has a learning disability uh, and who would benefit from accommodations in post-secondary, it's really important to start that conversation with the accessibility services office now. Most, uh, um, all universities provide provisional accommodations to youth who were receiving it based on an IEP and older assessment, and they all require an updated assessment. So one of the works, uh, one of the things I do in private practice in my clinic at the PsychoEd clinic is to provide youth with an updated assessment for their university for the purpose of accommodations. And uh, it's really important to make sure that that assessment is done in a way that fits the criteria of that accessibility services office. So if you are going either to my clinic or anywhere else, make sure that you ask the professional to have a conversation with your university's accessibility services office about what they're looking for. But even without an assessment, the first step and the most important step is if you have a youth who has learning needs and who would benefit from accommodations, start the conversation with the accessibility services office. And this is one of those areas where I think as a parent, you can take a more active role in helping the youth send that initial email, complete those forms, especially if the youth uh, struggles with the executive functioning skills of putting all these documents together, getting a copy of the IEP. Um, this is one, one area where I would ask parents to actually be more active because getting that documentation in and making sure that they have the supports they need during this transition can really help them down the road in terms of both getting the support they need and also feeling less anxious. 
I would jump in also to say that it's often they have better accessibility and better options for uh, support at the university or college level than they do have at the Absolutely. high school level. Mm -hmm. So you may be very surprised at what your child can access, uh, note takers, special you know rooms to take the exams, accessibility mm -hmm. on computers, for example, all kinds of things that the school boards at the high school level just can't offer. So you may mm -hmm. be pleasantly surprised and your, your, yeah. your youth may also be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and, and starting that conversation is important because again, even if your assessment is outdated, they will provide you with some wraparound service until you are able to get an updated assessment. Um, there are more supports and services, and if you have a youth with a disability, including a learning disability, this is a wonderful website uh, maintained provincially. Uh, it's called transitionresourcesguide.ca, and this will have all the universities and all the information you need for each university in terms of the, the contact for the accessibility services office, the programming they offer. Some universities have special programming, including special orientations or courses for youth who have, for example, a learning disability. Some universities such as Trent and Guelph actually have a first year course to teach learning skills to students who may have a learning disability that may interfere with some of their academic output, um, matching up their cognitive potential. So wonderful resource to check out if your youth um, may benefit from these accommodations and services. I love that. So I'm going to actually uh, just mention that uh, Ruth is at, uh, in her uh, training program and, and their RUMAC Learning Center. Um, they take care of this topic, so it's not one I'm going to go into. Just to mention that learning about learning, or what we call meta learning, these skills like note taking, uh, uh, learning how to approach tests, uh, studying techniques using flashcards or space repetitions are important topics to learn before going to university. Um, there was a longer presentation I did for the school boards in Toronto um, that I'll, I'll provide the link to, to Ruth that can share with you where we go more in depth into that. And of course, um, the resources that are offered at Rumex Learning Center uh, go in depth into these topics. So uh, I'll, I will just wrap up by saying that managing attention um, my research and intervention at York University showed that this was one of the most important challenges youth face. And in fact, uh, as part of that research, I developed this uh, training toolkit for first year students that's now part of uh, the orientation at York University and is freely available online. It's called Hashtag Study Hacks, um, you know, trying to be youth friendly. And it, it talks about different skills most important among them being how do you manage distractions and how do you manage attention, for example, including using the Pomodoro technique. And again, the links will be provided in the slides. On that note, um, I'm going to wrap up and uh, by this picture, this is a picture uh, from back of one of the classes I was uh, TAing, being a teaching assistant for, to show that you know it's students do sometimes struggle with attention, even in the lecture, let alone when they're at home and bombarded with distraction. So this is one key area that I think is important to invest time and energy in, and it's one that I know that uh, Ruth and the Ruth Romack Learning Center do. Um, so on that note, thank you for having me as a presenter. It was a pleasure being here, and I'll turn it back to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Dr. Javoshi, but stick around because we've got questions coming in. For sure, yeah. So one question is, uh, are there good books for youth to learn about prioritization and organizational skills? I, I'll start off by saying, I think, you know, if you're going to give your kid a book about it, um, they may or may not actually take the time to read it. I think mm -hmm. if you look uh, at some of the the you know the, the student hacks or some things online or to have um, other youth, that's actually that's interesting because um, we like to sort of take information from our university students and share it with our high school students. So that way, it's sort of from the mouth of the person who's who's actually been living it. Um, I I can't think of any particular books offhand. There are some books like The Seven Habits of uh, Successful Students, which is, I think it's Covey, is that that's the last name I think is Covey. Joelle can check on that. Um, but there are several different you know, sort of organization and prioritization books. I'm going to have to think of some particular names, but I'll, I'll try and get, um, I will try and get a, a short book list together and we can send that out to you as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, so please take a moment and put your, I would love it if even if you don't have a question, if you would put in your takeaways, what is the one thing or two things that you really found interesting for tonight? Um, Susan says it was great. So thank you, Susan. I really appreciate that. Uh, but any other questions? There was a question that came in earlier while you're thinking of your questions. Um, somebody asked, when do you start applying to universities? When do you figure out residences? And when do you cash in RESPs? Well, in terms of starting to apply for a university, uh, there's something called the Ontario Universities Application Center. And if you are applying to Ontario universities and you're doing it through your high school, all of that information goes through the uh, OUAC. And if you go on their website, ouac.on.ca, uh, there is a whole list of deadlines. And generally the application information will be sent out uh, around November and most universities or the, the Ontario Universities Application Center needs that completed application by the middle of January. This year, I think it's gonna be January 13th. So that's some, some important dates to hold in mind because your, your youth may not share all that information with you that they're getting from the school. So it's a good resource to have. Um, we've got some other questions. Let's see. I'm still not clear when to step in as a parent when your student is not that organized, but not really in trouble yet. That's a very long conversation. I think it, it, it depends on the particular child. Um, and I, I might say to have some regular check in conversations like have a date and say, I, you know, I would mm -hmm. love, I'd like to check in with you on Friday afternoons. Let's, if they're in town or they're living with you, let's go for a walk and, and have a talk. Or if they're not, maybe you can do a FaceTime, but maybe having a regular check-in, almost like um, uh, a, a business meeting in some ways where it's formal. So you know that you can't let it slide. And they're just sharing what they're, what's on, what, you know, what they have coming up and how they're feeling about it and what they're, studies are like. Dr. Tavoshi, what would you say in terms of that fine line between stepping mm -hmm. in and not stepping in? And again, it's a challenging one. As a parent, you know your youth most. I would say it is okay to um, be a bit more active before they're starting their, their schooling and then to gradually release that, uh, to, to give that autonomy and responsibility to the youth and always do it in a collaborative way. So if you're thinking that the youth is disorganized, it is okay to say, hey, I, I can see that um, you know, you haven't had a chance to put all your syllabi in a calendar yet. Um, is this something I could help you with? Right, so you're giving the option to the youth to accept or deny that help, but it's okay for you to propose it. It is okay for you to say, I, you know, I can see that you're really struggling with, with this course. Um, do, do you want um, to brainstorm some ideas of how um, you may be able to tackle it or how uh, we may be able to access resources, whether tutoring, whether um, after school programming or after uh, you know, course um, support programs in university, there are prep courses sometimes. Um, so you can have a conversation with the youth and say, um, is this something you could you would want my help with? It is okay to approach the youth with uh, with that. But again, the, the ball is in the youth's court to say, no, I've got this or yeah, I really need your help. And when they say, I really need your help, again, it's important to, and I, I, I leave it to your judgment to not jump in and do it for the youth because otherwise that, that skill isn't being learned. Is to really localize the problem. Say, okay, what's, what's getting in the way of you right now organizing? Is it that we haven't set a time aside? So do you need my help to put an hour aside a week? You can put in your calendar or make a notification in your phone where you sit down and you plan what you have to do for that week. What's getting in the way of you right now not being able to organize? Um, is it that you don't have an organization system? Okay, well, can we spend some time together learning about organization systems? Is it that you don't have the materials you need? You don't have a laptop or you don't have the binders you need? Okay, do you need my support in ordering them or can we go to, you know, to Staples together to buy them? So um, you can try to localize what the problem is and then help the youth problem solve that. I really like the idea of asking, what do you need to succeed? What, what can I do for mm -hmm. you at this moment? Um, another thing is sometimes you may have to look for outside support and sometimes that parent child dynamic moving from the parent child to uh, emerging adult is tricky and sometimes you need to ask for some help outside of the family the family. Um, and there, as we've mentioned, are many, many resources for that, both at the university and privately, etc. 
Um, but if you if you still want some more information, you can certainly reach out to either myself or Dr. Tavoshi or both of us and, and pick both of our brains. I'm sure that that uh, I know that I'm definitely available and I have a feeling Dr. Tavoshi would be as well. OK, we've got a couple of more questions um, and some other comments. So we have a very insightful presentation. Thank you from Jill. Thank you, Jill. Annie says, I really like the struggle plan. Have a plan before anything happens. I completely agree. Chantel says, oh, that was Chantel's question about when to step in. Alfred says, which academic stream should I be in in grade nine or 10 in order to, for me to go to university or college? Uh, I would say generally, Alfred, that you want to stay on the academic side or the college, university, the C or the U courses. Um, if you're taking courses that are not college bound or university bound, it makes it more difficult to get into the college stream or the university stream in the end. If I could add, Alfred, it's really important to have a meeting with your guidance counselor. So the, yes. the guidance counselors are, are very professional and they know all the streams and all the programs, college and university, and, and they will really help you navigate this. You don't have to do it on your own. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, and Seeb says, good tips for the newbies to look at organizing themselves, like the stress on syllabi and how to well have be well acquainted and treat yourself, treat it like a map uh, to navigate through the course. I really like that too. It's a roadmap. And Jill said, would very much appreciate the hacks link mentioned. Um, I wonder if we could put it in the chat. Do, is there a particular link for all those hacks it was at university it was through the university york university um, uh, i could send you uh, a document with all these resources um because we, we also did this for the presentation with, uh, for the school boards great. that has the link to the videos uh, also the, the other presentations including metal learning topics and um uh, if you um, i'll be happy to share that and of course you can share it with, with the participants if they desire so wonderful and there was something i forgot to mention at the beginning that you will be receiving uh, an email from us probably tomorrow with all of the some some goodies and some great information including resources and and the different links um as well as if you are watching this on a, a review if you're watching a recording then feel free to send uh, an email to info at ruthrumac.com i N F O at R U T H R U M A C K uh, dot com, and then just ask for the information from the from this presentation, and we'll be happy to send it out to you as well. So, if you have somebody that couldn't attend tonight but would like to, uh, or you think would have uh, appreciated this information, you can um, send them the link when when it's rec recorded as well. Um, and what else do we have? Susan also said. I really like the idea of reinterpreting the syllabus to personalize it. I also like the term meta learning. I'd heard of meta thinking, but meta learning was new to me. So I, I just have to say, you know, this is a this is a wonderful time and it's a scary time and it's exciting time. As some people say, they're nervous sighted, a little bit of each. There's some anxiety, but there's anticipation. And I would say to parents and to to our youth, our emerging adults, that to enjoy it, you know, to to embrace this change, to embrace the transition. The more prepared you are, the more information you have, the stronger you will feel, the more prepared you will feel, and the more successful you will be. So I, once again, thank you, Dr. Chavoshi from PsychoEd Clinic, and I just really appreciate your time. And thank you to you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you'll join us again next time.